It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots to talk about. Our first Patch Tuesday of 2021. Not a record breaker. Only one zero day. Just one? Just one. We'll also talk about a flaw, a side channel attack in Google's Titan security keys. Uh-oh. And Steve explains why you probably don't have to worry about how secure your messenger is anyway. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 802, recorded Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. Where the plain text is. Security Now is brought to you by ESET. ESET protects businesses worldwide with internet security products and services backed by world-class research and tech support. You can get a free trial and an interactive demo at business.eset.com slash twit. And by ExpressVPN. Stop handing over your personal data to ISPs who mine your activity and sell off your information. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash security now. And by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code TWIT in the How'd You Hear About Us box. It's time for security now. Oh, I know you've been waiting all week. We, I know we have a lot of people who oh, can't wait till Tuesday. Security now. Here's the guy, Steve Gibson. Yay, the man you've all been waiting for from GRC.com and our you know, security guru. We ought to really consider naming the, renaming the podcast. What? Could possibly go wrong. <laughs> oh, there's plenty, isn't there, Steve? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> indeed. So, uh, the the title of this one came to me. Well, I sort of stumbled on it when I was sort of laying out the case that I'll be making at the end of the podcast. So, at the moment, the title, where the plain text is, might not be immediately obvious. But it ends up being a fun title when I, when I end up pulling the pieces together. This is Security Now number 802 for January 19th of 2021. Uh, lots of interesting stuff to talk about. We're going to look at one aspect in which Chrome and Chromium differ, which, you know, because like the, the difference has never really been clear. It turns out uh, Google realized that there was one difference they should have been better enforcing than they were. Then we're going to take, uh, take a look at some nice growth news from the unfortunately named DuckDuckGo folks. Um, Google's Project Zero has reported on some terrific detective work they've done uh, and also asked a really important question that we'll take a look at. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit of a look back at last week's Patch Tuesday, what lessons there were there, what happened, and, and also at Microsoft's pending change in the flaws which, or the remediation, I should say, of the flaws, which enabled last year's zero logon debacle. That's coming with next month's Patch Tuesday, but just want to make sure all of our listeners are ready for it in, in the IT environment. Also, the NSA's interesting statement about enterprises, and I would, I would say and the DOH protocol, but maybe versus the DOH protocol would be putting it better. Um, we're going to look at the research that uh, cracked the secret key out of Google's supposedly uncrackable hardware Titan Fido U2F dongle. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then we catch up with a bit of listener feedback, which allows me to tie up a couple loose ends from our Out with the Old podcast last week. Then we're going to wrap up by looking at various aspects of the frenzy caused by WhatsApp's quite predictable move to incorporate its users' conversation metadata into Facebook's monetization ecosystem. Uh, and that brings us back to the title of the podcast, Where the Plain Text Is. Oh, boy. 
of course, we do have a fun picture of the week. So I think a great podcast for our listeners. Wouldn't be security now without a picture of the week, would it? Uh, thanks to our fabulous listeners who uh, send me a constant trickle of these things. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, after I do this show, I imagine that people who listen to it have somewhat of a similar reaction. I get a little paranoid, right? Like, I get a little scared. And I it often uh, Russell's here uh, on Tuesdays or Wednesdays, our, uh, our MSP, our uh, IT guy. And it's almost always if, you know, if I come out of, I come out of security now with my eyes bugged out and I go, uh, Russell, <laughs> Russell, are we safe? <laughs> and the fun, you know, I mean, or variations thereof. And Russell always says, yeah, no, don't worry. We're good. We're protected. Uh, and I go, OK. Whew. The other day I say, how do you know? And I won't go into all of the things we do because we do more than one thing. As you know, security is all about layers. But he did say we use ESET. And I said, oh, I know ESET. I've been talking about ESET antivirus for years. Uh, but this is ESET Enterprise. ESET Enterprise-grade security that's easy to manage for a small business like ours. We don't have a full-time IT department. It has a light system footprint. In fact, it's kind of funny because... We've been using it for years, but I didn't even know. I didn't have no idea. It's so light that our editors have it on their edit stations. You know, they need every cycle. They need all the RAM, but they can run ESET on their editors' uh, boxes, those Dell Precision uh, workstations, because it doesn't take up a lot of resources. Now, ESET has some really exciting new news. They just introduced their brand new endpoint security management platform. They call it ESET Protect. I wanted to tell you about this. What, one of the main things about ESET Protect is it's cloud. It has a cloud-based management for businesses of all sizes and no restriction on seat size. So it's one flat rate. Now, this is great. Because Russell isn't on-prem most of the time. But because of the cloud management, he can check in at any time. We have endpoints all over the place because everybody's working from home now. We need this kind of protection. It takes security to a whole new level. New bundled products featuring enhanced protection against the thing that gives me chills every night, ransomware, zero-day threats. I love this. It includes full-disk data encryption capabilities for Windows and Mac. I love that. Uh, you don't have to use the operating system's sometimes questionable uh, full disk protection. You can use ESETs. For small businesses and MSPs, I recommend ESET Protect Advanced. I suspect this is the one Russell's using. It's a bundle that has all the security you need, as well as that cloud-based management console. ESET Protect Advanced includes endpoint protection, cloud sandboxing. We've talked about that before. This is so cool. When it detects something it doesn't know about, but it's concerned, there's a data attachment or whatever, it'll open it up in the cloud in a sandbox which get, and then monitor its behavior. It gives you advanced threat detection and prevention, even against zero days. I mentioned that full disk encryption. I think that's so cool. File server security, a cloud-based console. You, can, you get the choice. If you prefer on-prem management, they also offer that option. But either way, you're getting powerful, reliable security from the best in the business. 30 years of research and innovation. It's not just me. ESET just earned top ratings in the AV Comparatives Endpoint Prevention and Response Comparative Report. They tested nine vendors. ESET not only achieved the highest combined prevention and response score in the test, but also demonstrated outstanding, outstanding was the word they used, overall detection and reporting capabilities. He said, top rating of strategic leader, signifying a product that has a very high return on investment. That's good for you to know. Total cost of ownership is very low. And, and this is, I'm sure, part of Russell's thinking, ex exceptional technical capabilities. Now, this AV Comparatives is one of the most comprehensive tests of endpoint detection and response solutions and endpoint security products ever conducted. Uh, and so these are really impressive results. And, I, you know, I'm not surprised. ESET's always been number one in my book. They understand the security needs and concerns of small and medium-sized businesses like ours. Trust ESET. To future-proof your business, you can get a free trial and an interactive demo right now. Business.eset.com slash twit. That's business.eset.com slash twit. We thank them so much for supporting Security Now. They're big fans, but we thank you, Security Now listeners. I know you're a fan, too. This is how you support the show. 
If you're if you're interested, go to businessstudieset.com and make sure you put that slash twit on the end, and you'll get a free trial of ESET's award-winning endpoint protection. Thank you, ESET. All right, are we ready for the picture of the week, Mr. G? <laughs> so, this is uh, it's just fun. Uh, just a, a cute little cartoon. We have a, a, a an aviator flying a little one-man jet, you know, fighter kind of thing. And he is seen to be saying, damn, cloud computers, because he's flying through a bunch of clouds where they are laced with computers. And, of course, they're bouncing off of his machine, uh, off of his airplane. <laughs> well, one of them says bounce. One says pock. I got a kick out of the fact that one of them is ping. And there on the back, it says cron as it bounced off the machine. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah. So anyway, just sort of a fun little uh, cartoon of, uh, yes, the, a different meaning of the term cloud computers. Very you don't want to actually have computers in the cloud because mm, you, know. you might fly through them and then that would be bad. Yeah. So uh, when is Chrome not Chromium? We all know that Google's worldwide leading Chrome browser is based upon the open source and very solid Chromium core. Uh, and this tends to beg the question, how are Chrome and Chromium similar and different from one another? Because, as we've said, you've got Safari and Firefox, and then everything else is now Chromium. Uh, one of the Chromium-based browsers is Chrome, but there's a whole bunch of others that are all based on, that, on, on the Chromium core. So at least one way in which Chrome is meant to be different from Chromium is in the way Google specific features that are available only in Chrome operate. These are things like Chrome Sync and Click to Call or signing into the user's Google account and transacting personal sync data, bookmarks, passwords, history, open tabs, settings, preferences, and in some cases even payment info saved in Google Pay. That's meant to be Chrome specific. Well, it turns out the Chrome API provides direct hooks that as the Chrome API, as opposed to Chromium API, the Chrome API provides direct hooks into those services that no other third party web browser is meant to have. Yet Google Chrome engineering director, uh, Jochen Isinger explained that during a recent audit, they discovered that some of the third-party Chromium-based browsers were integrating features whoops, <clears throat> that were only intended for Google's use with Chrome. These APIs were intended to be private and specific only to Google Chrome, but apparently there was no enforcement of that. They were never intended to be integrated into any non-Google, non-Chrome browser use. He declined to indicate which browsers had integrated Chrome Sync without authorization, but he did say that Google would be blocking this unintended behavior starting on the 15th of March, so two months from a couple days ago. Um, by removing access to Chrome Sync for other Chromium web browsers, it, it will remove their ability, which apparently they've had kind of quietly, to integrate the Chrome Sync API to sync their users' data to all devices where they're logged into their Google account. However, Google did explain that users who have accessed private Google features such as Chrome Sync while using third-party browsers will still be able to access the synced data locally or in their Google account, depending upon their sync settings. They'll also be able to manage their data by going to the My Google Activity page, as well as downloading it from the Google Takeout page and or, you know, by managing it also delete it by going there. So anyway, just sort of, I thought this was sort of interesting that, that, you know, Google is very generously sharing the Chromium engine with all other browsers, 
It doesn't seem to be hurting Chrome's market share any. But there was some stuff that was like, no, no, that's just for us, which they weren't enforcing before. So they're now going to add some enforcement to that so that it only runs in their own browser. And again, you know, not a big loss for anybody, just sort of one, I guess, one fewer feature that they shouldn't have had. But you can still get it if you just go to the Google uh, pages themselves. Um, though it's not a browser, this bit of news relating does news is related to our browsing. Not long ago, we talked about the privacy centric duck, duck, go search engine. And I had some fun talking about, well, actually Leo, you were cluing me in on ch some children's game, uh, after which this <laughs> search engine was unfortunately named, uh, and, and we imagined that much as Google it has obtained a generally understood meaning that perhaps someday the same will happen with duck it. Uh, although I'm not holding my breath on that one. Yeah, maybe um, not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You know, duck. Is that what they're pushing? Sort of, I, I'm hearing some people saying I, I saw someone said duck duck. And I don't think that works either. So, no. you know, this is, you know, the cross this poor guy is going to have to bear in deciding to name his search engine DuckDuckGo. I mean, okay, maybe he thought since Google was kind of whimsical, they could get away with it, but no. Yeah. Anyway, despite its name, the good news is it is actually a serious contender in the rather rarefied search engine space these days. So I wanted to take a moment to share a milestone that it reached for the first time last Monday. Um, last Monday, for the first time in its 12-year history, DuckDuckGo recorded its first day ever of more than 100 million user search queries. For the past two years, DDG, uh, well, which is a less painful abbreviation, has been in a period of sustained growth. And especially since last August, when they began seeing more than 2 billion search queries a month on a regular basis. Okay, now, to give that some context, however, since that seems like a lot, right? 2 billion search queries a month regularly. Google does 5 billion a day. So, okay, they're not at Google's level, obviously, yet, but... They're growing. Um, I have put a chart in the show notes, which is interesting. This shows uh, it anchors on last Monday, well, actually Monday before last, but it shows the 14-day region around there, starting with, with January 1st, where they were at 77.1 uh, million queries and then they, they get up into the mid to high 80s. And then on, su on the Sunday before that Monday, um, they, on, on the 10th of January, they were at 94.8 million. And then Monday, they went to 102. They've since, on, on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they didn't quite make 100 million, but they were in the very high 90s, 99, 98, 97. So anyway... Um, they're, they're there. Uh, and clearly the idea of searching without dragging all of Google's tracking and advertising baggage along uh, is appealing to people. Um, they have also, I wanted to note, expanded beyond their own browser URL as the only way to get there. They've got mobile apps for Android and iOS, as well as a dedicated Chrome extension for Duck, duck, go browsing. And in a tweet last September, they indicated that the apps and extension have been installed more than 4 million times. So, uh, oh, and in another win for the company, uh, duck, duck, go has been selected as the default search engine in the Tor browser. Remember, once upon a time, that was Firefox. Now, duck, duck, go. Um, and it will often appear as the default search engine in the private browsing modes of several other browsers, which is kind of nice. You switch into private browsing and you get a, a privacy-oriented search engine as part of that. So 
Anyway, just to sort of keep it on our listeners' radar, I wouldn't be at all surprised if our privacy and security conscious users uh, are counted among many of DuckDuckGo's users, <laughs> despite the name. Um, last Tuesday, Google's Project Zero published a six-part series which tapes, takes a very deep analytical look at a discovery the group made a year ago, that is during the first quarter of last year. Um, last week I was talking about watering hole attacks where a browser vulnerability, in this case it was that SCTP protocol vulnerability, where unlike a JavaScript vulnerability, which is occurring locally using code in your browser, in this case, in this in this SCTP protocol, in order to be exploited, the user would have needed to visit, um, often being lured to, a so-called watering hole server. So I especially appreciated the way Google framed this campaign of theirs. Um, here's how they began the first of these six pages in this subst very substantial posting. They said, at Project Zero... We often refer to our goal simply as make zero day hard. This is not the first time we've talked about this. I think it's exactly the right goal. They said members of the team approach this challenge mainly through the lens of offensive security research as opposed to just like responding to how do they prevent. They said, and while we experiment a lot with new targets and methodologies, in order to remain at the forefront of the field, it is important that the team doesn't stray too far from the current state of the art. One of our efforts in this regard is the tracking of publicly known cases of zero day vulnerabilities. In other words, they're like, they look at, like, really look at each of them and ask a, bu a bunch of questions about them. They said, we use this information to guide the research. Unfortunately, public zero-day reports rarely include captured exploits, which could provide invaluable insight into exploitation techniques and design decisions made by real-world attackers. They said, in addition, we believe that there is a gap in the security community's ability to detect zero-day exploits. Therefore... Project Zero has recently launched our own initiative aimed at researching new ways to detect zero-day exploits in the wild. Through partnering with Google Threat Analysis Group, TAG, one of the first results of this initiative was the discovery of a watering hole attack in the first quarter of 2020 performed by a highly sophisticated actor. They said, we discovered two exploit servers delivering different exploit chains via watering hole attacks. One server targeted Windows users, the other targeted Android. Both the Windows and the Android servers used Chrome exploits for the initial remote code execution. The exploits for Chrome and Windows included zero days. For Android, the exploit chains use publicly known N-Day exploits, and of course referred to as N-Day because, as I've often noted, they're only true zero days if they are not previously known. So if it's a publicly known thing, then by definition it's an N-Day. Then they said, based on the actor's sophistication, we think it's likely that they had access to Android zero days, but we did not discover any in our analysis. So I have a, a, a picture in the show notes of the, the chart that they, that they provided along with this analysis where they show on the left incoming a number of affected websites, one, two, dot, dot, dot to N. And that those websites deliver 
a pair of iframes, which are which have no contact or affiliation with each other, other than that they they are sourced from the same set of servers. And then one iframe will pull content from the Windows exploit server, because remember, an, an iframe itself is a reference to some third-party server that it pulls content from to fill the frame. The other iframe pulled its content from the Android exploit server. So both of them would do that, and and presumably they they only pull content based on the platform they find themselves running in. So if the if the Windows content pulling iframe sees that it's running on a Chrome browser on Windows, then it pulls the content. And the, but whereas the Android iframe would just lay leave itself inert and pull nothing. Whereas if it's if it finds that it's running Chrome on Android, then the the Windows iframe would not bother pulling iframe exploits into its frame, whereas the Android iframe would. So from that point, then they go in the the Windows exploit iframe performs some Chrome renderer exploits, um, and the Android exploit, if it's on Android, performs one of a number of Chrome renderer exploits. You know, those being the the problems that that Google discovered being exploited by this particular attack. So. And of course, one of the things you note is that since the multiple servers apparently are serving this content, you know, this could well have been a malvertising campaign since, as we know, uh, ads run in iframes on their hosting pages. Um, anyway, so they continue uh, their explanation saying, from the exploit servers, we have extracted... So, so the beauty of this is that they, they discovered this campaign while it was underway, which is what differentiates it from the typical zero days they learn about from, from third parties. They found this one, which allowed them to, to extract a great deal of knowledge about the attackers because it was still alive. So they said, from the exploit servers, we have extracted – Renderer exploits for four bugs in Chrome, one of which was still a zero day at the time of the discovery, meaning that they they found something they didn't know about, a bug they didn't know Chrome had when, when they saw this thing working. They also found two sandbox escape exploits abusing three zero day vulnerabilities in Windows and a privilege escalation kit composed of publicly known N-Day exploits for older versions of Android. And of course, we know, unfortunately, older versions of Android are really much a large population of Android. So even though they're publicly known, they're still very likely to be active. They said the four zero days discovered in these chains have been fixed by the appropriate vendors. They said, we understand this attacker to be operating a complex targeting infrastructure, though it didn't seem to be used every time. In some cases, the attackers used an initial renderer exploit to develop detailed fingerprints of the users from inside the sandbox. In these cases, the attacker took a slower approach, sending back dozens of parameters from the end user's device before deciding whether or not to continue with further exploitation and use a sandbox escape. In other cases, the attacker would choose to fully exploit a system straight away or not attempt any exploit at all. In the time, they said, we had available before the servers were taken down, we were unable to determine what parameters determined the fast or slow exploitation paths? The Project Zero team, they said, came together and spent many months analyzing in detail each part of the collected chains. What did we learn? 
These exploit chains are designed for efficiency and flexibility through their modularity. They are well-engineered, complex code with a variety of novel exploitation methods, mature logging, sophisticated and calculated post-exploitation techniques, and high volumes of anti-analysis and targeting checks. So they, so these exploits were themselves v operating very defensively. They said, we believe that teams of experts have designed and developed these exploit chains. We hope this blog post series provides others with an in-depth look at exploitation from a real-world, mature, and presumably well-resourced actor. The remaining posts in this series share the technical details of different portions of the exploit chain, largely focused on what our team found most interesting. They said, we include detailed analysis of the vulnerabilities being exploited and each of the different exploit techniques, a deep look into the bug class of one of the Chrome exploits and an in-depth teardown of the Android post-exploitation code. They said, in addition, we are posting root cause analysis for each of the four zero days discovered as a part of these exploit chains. Exploitation aside, the modularity of payloads, interchangeable exploitation chains, logging, targeting, and maturity of this actor's operation set these apart. We hope that by sharing this information publicly, we are continuing to close the knowledge gap between private exploitation, what well-resourced exploitation teams are doing in the real world, and what is publicly known. And, and again, this is, this is chilling a bit like the whole solar wind revelations were. You know, the, the idea that, that there is this kind of high level, sophisticated, methodical, careful, and clearly in many cases, very targeted use of, of, of currently unknown vulnerabilities, you know, sort of should be sobering for us because, because the idea is that, that these actors know who they want, whose systems they want to get into, whose Android phones they want to penetrate, whose Windows systems they want to penetrate. They, they, around, they arrange to get them to visit a server somehow hosting some content, which then puts these iframe payloads onto their browser window. We know that the chances are very high that Certain, an Android user will be using Chrome. A Windows user will be using Chrome. And they found ways to, to break through, you know, the, these renderer exploits are, are in as in page rendering exploits. So they have rendering flaws that let them escape from Chrome's deliberate containment. And then they go about doing what they want to do. For anyone who's interested in following up, I do have a link to uh, this Google Project Zero uh, blog page, which is the first of this multi-page uh, uh, presentation for anyone who's interested. But what I thought to be the single most important phrase in what I read was where the Project Zero guys wrote, quote, in addition, we are posting root cause analysis for each of the four zero days discovered as part of these exploit chains. The key words there were root cause analysis. You know, in other words, oh crap, we just found another zero day. All, yeah, always definitely better to have found it than not, but much better for it never to have existed in the first place. So rather than just fixing it and saying, who, and then going to lunch, let's instead order in and spend lunchtime asking ourselves 
how this fault was introduced in the first place and what takeaway lessons we can learn to preemptively prevent anything that, like this from happening again. That is essentially what they're doing. They are, they are looking at every one of these zero days carefully, the code that surrounds it, um, you know, how did it happen? Um, and, and I think this is exactly what needs to be done. Um, and, and clearly, the continuing prevalence of software bugs, which beleaguer our industry, suggests that examining root causes occurs far too infrequently. I, I've commented here on the podcast in the past that, that I truly love solving problems and puzzles with code. For me, it, it's a passion and a craft. So whenever I find a bug in my own code, as I've said before, I come to a dead stop and I spend some time asking myself and exploring how that bug happened in the first place. What was I thinking? Uh, exactly what did I get wrong? Is it likely to have happened elsewhere? Do I have a bad habit that needs correcting? In other words, rather than being embarrassed about a bug, be informed by it. You know, some, some incorrect way of thinking caused it. Um, and so I would submit that the only way for any craftsman to improve at their craft is to rather carefully examine and understand their mistakes. Certainly, Leo, we know this is the case with chess, right? The reason all of the, the really high-end masters record every move of their game is they're going to take a look at that later and spend a lot of time examining the board at, at each stage and, 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 and understand why they lost the game. You bet. Uh, yeah. If, in fact, they did. It's, it's, you know, at, at a certain point, it's the only way. You're just not going to get better by hoping to do better next time. At some point, you know, you, you really have to understand the nature of the mistakes you're making in, in order not to make them again. And there have been instances where I have found a bug where I realized, oh, my God, there are others of these. And I've like I've you know <laughs> designed <laughs> you know designed a, a a a regular expression a regex which will find the other places uh -huh. where I almost certainly did the same cool. thing wrong yeah. and you know and and fixed other ones. So it's hard for pr it's, people because we we're blind to our own mistakes often. That's it's so yes. hard to do your own debugging. Because you stare and you stare and you stare at the code and you go, looks great, it looks great. I don't <laughs> understand. I can't, you know. But it, I agree with you. It, it, there is a certain sport to it as well. It's kind of fun. Oh, it is. And when and when you when you are stepping through the code and the debugger like shows you like, okay, I'm moving this into EAX, and it's like, wait a minute. Uh, I just wiped out what was there, right. which I'm going to be needing in two steps later. It's it like, must be oh! so easy to do that in assembly code because, you know, any modern high-level language has all sorts of protections yeah. so that you avoid that kind of thing. But it's all on you, an assembler. Well, it, it is. But what I like about it is nothing is hidden. There are right. no, like... This I meant for this to be unsigned, and it's you know, like now you know blah blah blah. It's like no, there's no such thing right. in in assembler. So, yeah. Um, there is such thing as a break, though, Leo. Oh yes. And this might be a good time. I'm Let's getting a little dry here. I'm going to take a sip of take water. a break. <clears throat> when you uh, retire, I'm going to get you into Lisp because one of the cool things about programming in Lisp is <clears throat> you can actually debug a running program. And go in and look at values and change values. And uh, I don't think any programming language since Lisp and Smalltalk has allowed you to do that. That's, I was going to say Smalltalk is Smalltalk does that way. too, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's, once you start doing that, it's kind of addictive. It's hard, it's, it's hard to go back to the debugging of old static code. Hey, our show today brought to you by ExpressVPN. 
They're debugging your internet service provider. How do you choose which internet service provider, right? For most of us, it isn't a choice. You know, <laughs> uh, ISPs are basically monopolies in this country, at best duopolies. And for most of us, uh, certainly for me, it's like, well, I'm going to have to go with Comcast. The problem is that these companies now, as we know, take advantage of that monopoly power uh, in their pricing, in their data caps, in their throttling. The thing that really should bug you is that many ISPs, and this is perfectly legal, log what you do online <clears throat> and sell that information to other big tech companies or advertisers. And that should irritate the heck out of you. You're already overpaying for your internet service, <clears throat> but this is even worse. So that's the argument for running ExpressVPN. You could put ExpressVPN on a router. Many routers support it, which means your entire house is protected. You put it on individual devices. And ExpressVPN has apps for everything, iOS, Android, Mac, PCs, everything you use. It's a simple app. That encrypts all your network data. I shouldn't. I don't have to explain a VPN to you. You guys know. Secures your interaction on the internet, and it keeps everything you're doing invisible to the hacker on the network. If you're at a coffee shop, to your internet service provider, to your carrier. If you're on the uh, on cell, it's it hides it all. But I got to tell you, at some point you have to merge into the public internet. That you do that at the VPN server and if you don't trust your vpn provider it's no better you haven't improved things that's why you got to use express vpn you can trust them and it, and it's not just blind trust they are regularly audited by pricewaterhousecooper the privacy policy they don't log they do not log and pwc has proved that and asserted and uh, you know certified that again and again they they are so express vpn is so adamant about this they actually created a technology they call trusted server when you log in <clears throat> when you press that button go on you know go vpn uh, you spin up a, a RAM-only instance of the VPN server, and it's sandboxed. It can't write to the disk. It can't, even if, you know, I don't know, a malicious employee wanted to or something. It can't. And then when you leave, when you close it, it's gone. It's in RAM-only. It's gone. And no trace of your visit exists. We know that PricewaterhouseCooper has verified that. <clears throat> we also know it from news stories, because in countries not like the U.S., but there are countries where they just, they don't have warrants. They just come and seize the servers. And in every case that's happened with ExpressVPN, the authorities have found nothing because there's nothing there. ExpressVPN is absolutely number one in privacy. That's why it's the number one rated VPN service by CNET and Wired. Stop handing over your personal data to ISPs. Protect yourself with a VPN you can trust. Plus, by the way, they invest in their infrastructure. They're the fastest out there. So fast, <clears throat> you can watch HD content easily on ExpressVPN, which means you can use their London uh, exit point to appear like you're in the UK, and you can watch all the Netflix UK you can eat, including all those Doctor Who episodes. Or tomorrow, let's be in Tokyo and watch all that great anime. And it's fast, so you don't even know it's on. I, I can't tell you how many times I've left ExpressVPN on on my laptop or my iPad and I've forgotten it for days. And, you know, there's no symptom of being on a VPN. It's super fast. They have uh, servers in almost 100 countries, so you can be anywhere in the world you want. It really is the best. It's a quality VPN. There are a lot of shady, cheap, low-cost VPNs. This is not one of them. This is what you want. I would say, which is a, a trustworthy, well-run VPN. It's ExpressVPN. I think ExpressVPN is a great deal. Stop handing your personal data over to ISPs and other tech giants who mine your activity, sell off your information. I put ExpressVPN on the router. That way everybody in the house is protected. Protect yourself with a VPN I trust to keep me private and secure online. Go to expressvpn.com slash security now. And you can get it three extra months free when you buy a one-year package. That's the best deal. Less than seven bucks a month for the best VPN out there. ExpressVPN.com slash security now. And they spell it out, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, -S, VPN. I think you know how to spell it. Dot com slash security now. Thank you, ExpressVPN, for supporting the show. Thank you 
for supporting Steve and Security Now by using that uh, offer, expressvpn.com slash security now. But now we return to a hydrated Steve Gibson. Fully so, hydrated. Fully hydrated. Um, we have the first Patch Tuesday of the year, 2021. Uh, 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 okay, so... We didn't break any records, Aww. Uh, and that's the good news. Um, uh, we had a total of 83 vulnerabilities, to, and, and we were like over 100 several early oh, yeah, of the early months yeah. last year. Yeah. Uh, Ten of those 83 uh, were Microsoft classified as critical, oh. and another was a zero day, which Ooh, we'll get to in a moment. Not good. Yeah. Not good, but good that it's patched and hopefully everybody's updated their machines. I just got the little notice while while you were talking, Leo, that this machine, this Windows 10 machine that I'm Skyping on will be restarting, but not during the podcast, fortunately. Um, two of the critical vulnerabilities that were fixed were remote code execution vulnerabilities in two codecs. One was a Microsoft DTV DVD video decoder. And the other was the HEVC video extensions, which we just had a problem recently. So, yes, yet again, uh, there was also a remote code execution vulnerability in the GDI Plus library, you know, the graphics device interface, and a critical memory corruption vulnerability in Microsoft Edge uh, in the browser. The remaining five critical remote code execution vulnerabilities were all found and fixed in Microsoft's RPC, the Remote Procedure Call Runtime, which is really not where you want to have remote code execution vulnerabilities because they are, you know, RPC is inherently exposed uh, on the network. The biggie was the zero day that was found in Microsoft Defender that is in the AV system being executed in the wild. They had found a mistake in Defender, and when the malware was being scanned by Defender, it took it over. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> whoops. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's being tracked as CVE 2021-1647, a remote code execution flaw in Microsoft's malware protection engine component, mpengine.dll. Sometimes when I look at Task Manager and browse through what the heck is going on, I'll see, oh, yeah, mpengine.dll. So the good news is uh, I'm mine on Windows 7. I don't even know if it's good or bad, come to think of it, but uh, <laughs> let's hope not. M most of them now are on Windows 10. Um, oh, and a proof of concept exploit for the flaw is public. So... We don't have any indication of how widespread the exploitation is or was, nor anything about its nature. But we do know that it was discovered taking over instances of Defender. Uh, so by now, we're post-patch by a week. I'd imagine that everyone has updated and rebooted. If not, eh, you know, I, I don't think this is like a pants-on-fire problem, but... You know, at least know that there is a bad problem that was a zero day that was fixed. So, yeah, good to reboot when you can. Um, also, with next month's Patch Tuesday, which will occur on February 9th, we have the final second phase of, the, of Microsoft's zero logon remediation, uh, as we know. From its extensive abuse last year after its discovery and patching, which <laughs> did very little to prevent it from being exploited post-patch, as, as you know, which demonstrates how few patching is like amazingly st uh, going on. Um, this was the zero logon flaw in Microsoft's previously believed to be more secure than it turned out to be. RPC net logon protocol, which provided the perfect means for attackers to move laterally within an organization after they had once established a foothold somewhere, 
it allowed them to effortlessly log on to the enterprise's master domain controller, which then literally gave them the keys to the kingdom. So the first of the two patches was in August, which fixed the security problem between Windows devices to reinforce truly secure remote procedure call communications for machine accounts on Windows devices, trust accounts, as well as all Windows and non-Windows domain controllers. In other words, as of August, window to Windows RPC was secured. But there's a large population of non-Windows devices that are also users of RPC. They were not previously understood to be as insecure as they, as we came to understand they were because RPC, the, the, the net logon protocol turned out you could put some zeros in some fields and everything would be just fine. So since August, IT admins have been able to log all non-secure use of RPC by various devices within their infrastructure in order to help them prepare for what's going to happen on February, which is drop dead day for all non windows devices, which have had this period, the sort of a grace period during which they could get themselves updated to be using secure RPC as have all windows systems since August after February 9th domain controller enforcement mode, as it's called will be enabled by default. Domain controller enforcement mode requires that all Windows and non-Windows devices use secure RPC with NetLogon secure channel. Unless customers explicitly override that, uh, and, you know, <laughs> good luck to you if you choose to, um, you can force it off if you've got some non-compliant device still in your system that you have to still be able to support. But at that point, when, you know, Microsoft is, is going to just wash their hands of you and say, okay, this is not our fault. If you now get, you know, ransomware that uses the fact that you've allowed non secure channel net log on because you have something that you just have to still keep using that refused to be updated, you know, some legacy box of some kind and, you know, and it is, it's publisher is you know, gone. And so, but you have to keep using it. Who knows what the scenario would be, but, you know, hopefully that's not the case. Next patch Tuesday, the final bit of deliberate insecurity of the net log on protocol will be eliminated. So hopefully everybody will be able to step up at that point. Now, in an interesting posting from the NSA, they are the NSA, the National Security Agency, are warning against outsourcing of DOH services. Um, in their seven page advisory titled Adopting Encrypted DNS in enterprise environments, which they posted last Thursday, the NSA warned against outsourcing DOH services to a third-party provider, which like, at first glance might seem a little odd. But okay, so here's their executive summary. The first bit of it is, yeah, a little, you know, obvious to all of us. They said, use of internet relies on translating domain names like nsa.gov to internet protocol addresses, right? This is the domain. This is the job of the domain name system, DNS. In the past, DNS lookups were generally unencrypted since they have to be handled by the network to direct traffic to the right locations. DNS over hypertext transfer protocol over transport layer security HTTPS, often referred to as DNS over HTTPS, DOH, encrypts DNS requests by using HTTPS to provide privacy, integrity, and last mile source authentication, 
with a client's DNS resolver. All that's true in case any of you haven't been paying attention in the last couple of years. Then they said, it is useful to prevent eavesdropping and manipulation of DNS traffic. While DOH can help protect the privacy of DNS requests and the integrity of responses, enterprises that use DOH will lose some of the control needed to govern DNS usage within their networks unless they allow only their chosen DOH resolver to be used. Enterprise DNS controls can prevent numerous threat techniques used by cyber threat actors for initial access, command and control, and exfiltration. So they said, using DOH with external resolvers can be good for home or mobile users and networks that do not use DNS security controls. For enterprise networks, however, NSA recommends using only designated enterprise DNS resolvers in order to properly leverage essential enterprise cybersecurity defenses, facilitate access to local network resources, and protect internal network information. The enterprise DNS resolver may be either an enterprise-operated DNS server or an externally hosted service. Either way, the enterprise resolver should support encrypted DNS requests, such as DOH, for local privacy and integrity protections. But all other encrypted DNS resolvers should be disabled and blocked. However, they said, if the enterprise DNS resolver does not support DOH, the enterprise DNS resolver should still be used and all encrypted DNS should be disabled and blocked until encrypted DNS capabilities can be further can be sorry can be fully integrated into the enterprise DNS infrastructure. This guidance explains the purpose behind the DOH design and the importance of configuring enterprise networks appropriately to add benefits to, but not hinder, their DNS security controls. The following recommendations will assist enterprise network owners and administrators to balance DNS privacy and governance. And I will blessedly spare all of us from any further of that, but for what it's worth, I completely agree with every sentence in that executive summary. I think they got it all exactly right. The only issue I might take is wondering about the value, let alone the necessity, of enabling DOH within the enterprise at all. I, I really don't see what value it provides if your, if your internal LAN has encrypted D DNS or not. Um, maybe that's a function of how big the encrypted LAN is. I mean, if, for example, once upon a time, HP was what? It was 15 dot, I think 14 dot and 15 dot. And if they somehow glued all of that into one single massive enterprise LAN, then, okay, maybe it would make sense to perform some encryption just because you've sort of created a, at that point, kind of a quasi-public LAN. It's so big. But but I really take their point. I, I think what, what they're responding to is that there are a lot of individuals inside of the enterprise that are saying, hey, cool, I, I can blind my enterprise's IT to everything I'm doing. You know, tech and privacy-minded employees might want to sneak their browser traffic out of the organization without being monitored. But, we, you know, we always remind everyone that the use of employer networks is the employers to oversee and regulate. So I would think that enterprises would be entirely correct to block the use of DOH and require browsers to use standard DNS and the organization's DNS with whatever added security filtering and malware detection the enterprise might wish to deploy. And yeah, bring up DOH in the enterprise and then 
users, browsers can use that. But anyway, I, I, I appreciate it, I guess, the NSA just, you know, kind of pointing out that, that circumventing all of an enterprise's uh, controls by, by immediately tunning, tunneling out to an external provider uh, is probably not the right thing to do. So anyway, uh, it was th- this, this posting of the NSA was picked up by all of the, of the various uh, security uh, monitoring websites. So I just thought I'd, I'd take a moment to say, yeah, I, I think I see their point completely. Um, huh. A side channel in Titan. The guys at Ninja Lab performed a classic side channel attack on Google's Titan Fido U2F security key by watching it work while monitoring its electromagnetic RF radiation they successfully extracted its embedded super secret deliberately designed to never be extracted private key yeah is it the same private key on yeah. all the titan keys no each no, key each has, key its, has own. its own of course yeah. yes but the whole point is all of the crypto is done on key, right. so it never exposes that private key. And once you have it, then you are 100% able right. to spoof the presence of that key. Do you have and to have physical point access being, to the key? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll explain all this in a second. We, we've talked about side channel attacks a lot in the past. You know, sometimes the power drawn by a device while it's performing cryptographic operations, will fluctuate a little bit. Sometimes the power supply, we talked about this, on a computer might emit different sounds. Or perhaps the timing required to perform an operation will vary. It could be anything. The coolest way of stating the goal of avoiding any possibility for a side channel is that that nothing about the behavior of a device should vary as a function of any internal secret bits. So taking timing as an example, the time required to perform some operation, typically the pattern of conditional jumps taken in the code, should be completely independent of the secret being kept. That is, you you should never have a jump taken or not, based on bits of a secret key. That would be just really bad. So the bits of the secret key must not cause the algorithm's code path to vary as like one of the base requirements for avoiding side channel attacks. The the fact is some things are feasible to hold constant, but others, I would argue, much as I argued like against Intel's claim of having a ransomware detector (laughs) in their processor last week, I would argue that some things really do fall below one's ability to control, such as the instantaneous electromagnetic radio frequency radiation of an integrated circuit that's doing the work. Yeah, you can't what I guess you could wrap it in tin foil. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, 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 and the problem is, you know, then you unwrap it, and right, right. Like, I mean, yeah. like, you know, even if you put a lid, like a lid on it, well, you pop the lid, and you know, and there it is. So, the 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 Ninja Labs guy said the Google Titan security key is a Fido U2F hardware device proposed by Google, available since July of 2018, as a two-factor authentication token to sign into applications, for example, your Google account. They said, our work describes a side channel attack that targets the Google Titan security keys secure element. And that's the NXP, which used to be Philips, they renamed NXP A700X chip by the observation of its local electromagnetic radiations during and they have here ECDSA, which, of course, is elliptic curve 
uh, DSA signatures, the core cryptographic operation of the FIDO U2F protocol. In other words, an attacker can create a clone of a legitimate Google Titan security key, period. To understand the NXP elliptic curve DSA implementation, find a vulnerability and design a key recovery attack. We had to make a quick stop on RIA, R-E-R-H-E-A. That's the NXP J3D081 Java card smart card. They said that is freely available on the web. This product looks very much like the NXP A700X chip and uses the same cryptographic library. RE, as an open Java card platform, gives us more control to study the elliptic curve DSA engine. So that was very clever. They realized that these two chips, the one they knew nothing about and the one they could know everything about, were very similar. So they trained themselves up using the open source full everything is known about it version and then cross applied that to the one they didn't know anything about. They said we could then show that the electromagnetic side channel signal bears partial information about the elliptic curve DSA ephemeral key. The sensitive information is recovered with a non-supervised machine learning method and plugged into a customized lattice-based attack scheme. Okay, so they said, finally, 4,000 ECDSA observations were enough to recover the known secret key on RIA and validate our attack process. It was then applied on the Google Titan security key with success, this time by using 6,000 observations, as we were able to extract the long-term elliptic curve DSA private key linked to a FIDO U2F account created for the experiment. In other words, the golden goose, the keys to the kingdom. Then they said, as a cautionary note, they said two-factor authentication tokens like FIDO U2F hardware devices, primary goal is to fight phishing attacks. Our attack requires physical access to the Google Titan security key, expensive equipment, custom software, and technical skills. Thus, as far as our study goes, it is still safer to use your Google Titan security key or other impacted products as FIDO U2F two-factor authentication token to sign into applications rather than not using one. And by the way, the Ubico uses the same Philips chip. So uh, it was conjectured that it would be subject to the same side channel attack. They said, nevertheless, this shows that the Google Titan security key and other impacted products would not avoid unnoticed security breach by attackers willing to put enough effort into it. Users that face such a threat should probably switch to other FIDO U2F hardware security keys where no vulnerability has yet been discovered. And I'm thinking, well, okay, but it hasn't been discovered until it has been. So the well, point is, also, don't let bad guys, you know, yes. take your <laughs> take your Google Titan and security key. And if they do, key. if you lose control of it, just deauthorize it. And then they yes. can't do anything with it. Uh, yes. Every single every uh, dongle related site that I use my YubiKey on yes. has the ability to remove a YubiKey and add a new YubiKey. I've done it many times. It's it, I mean the, the saving grace on this is they have to have access to the key. Right. Yeah. Right. And you know some secrets cannot be kept. And the fancier the system is the tries the more likely it is to have some behavior that gives it away. Uh, you know, unlike a, t a time-based one-time token, which uses symmetric cryptography, where each end 
needs to share a private key, systems like FIDO and for and also my own, Squirrel, use asymmetric public key cryptography where the user holds their private key and the remote ends holds their public key. This significantly reduces the risk to the user and to the system since the public keys never need to be kept secret. The takeaway for this hardware token hack is not to be too glib about the idea that the hardware token's private key cannot possibly be extracted. It clearly can be if someone is sufficiently determined and, as you said, Leo, if you, you know, you, it's like you accept the challenge of some hacker who says, oh, let me borrow your... I don't I mean, need your like, key, no. do you? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't let them have your key. You wouldn't give no. me your house that key. Would, uh, don't give them your, your Titan key either. That would be a bad idea. Yeah. Just borrow um, your house speaking, key for five seconds. It's, I'm, <laughs> speaking of tokens, I got an interesting tweet from Robert Rosenberg, which I got a kick out if he said, several podcasts ago, you were discussing the PayPal football. He says, well, I did it. I took it apart. He says, in parens, you got to be careful, but it's not hard. He says, found the battery type, bought one, and put it in. Next time I dealt with PayPal, I used the now working football and PayPal took it. They authenticated on my dead for years token. And he says, I'm guessing it's a press-based one-time password, not a time-based one-time password. And I completely agree with Robert. I think that we must have known that once, but I forgot. Since I do recall, as I mentioned before, noting that our listeners discovered that one of the digits was a simple modulus 10 counter. So it must have been that they like waited for it to turn off, then pressed it again and noted that one of the digits was simply incrementing zero through nine and back again. So it isn't clock based. There wasn't a timer in there. That really makes a lot more sense just, you know, in terms of all the problems that you would have with it becoming out of sync, out of time sync. A smartphone doesn't have that problem because it's on the cellular network and is getting a constant update of, of, of its clock. So anyway, just very cool, Robert. Thank you for sharing. You know, uh, if anyone's interested, if anyone still has the, the football, uh, you can change the battery and bring it back to life. Oh, good. Enough. Very, very cool. Uh, Peter Sinclair, he said, uh, regarding out with the old, it's a great show, Steve, great show. He says, Steve took me right back to the eighties. I agree with you stripping out the old code from spin, right? Six one. We still have our six O or older copies if we want to run on, on it on any heritage drives we might have lying around. And, and I'm just, I wanted to mention, I'm so glad that Peter noted that since I had forgotten to explicitly mention last week that all owners of Spinrite will continue to have access to previous versions five and six. Just yesterday, I removed support for diskette drives from the 6.1 code. Again, since they are so different from all other mass storage drives, uh, and there was a bunch of explicit special case handling support for diskettes laced throughout the code, and, and which is almost doing nobody any good. Uh, but diskettes are a medium that can benefit significantly from Spinrite. And every so often, uh, someone, typically an archaeologist, will come upon a diskette that's no longer readable, uh, but that still contains some important data. In such cases, we, su we suggest they download Spinrite 5, which all Spinrite 6 owners are able to do, because, oddly, for some reason, version 5 appears to do a better job on diskettes than version 6. And believe me, this has and continues to bug me. I've spent hours staring at the code, and, and I can't explain why that's the case. But I very clearly remember testing this, and Spinrite 5 was better than Spinrite 6 on diskettes. So 
Anyway, since 6.1 won't even see the diskette, you will be easily reminded to go get an earlier version of Spinrite. Uh, and you can, you know, they, co they cohabitate on your Spinrite boot uh, USB or CD or whatever. So, uh, it, you know, it's easy to have them all around. Anyway, just wanted to thank uh, Peter for uh, reminding, allowing me to remind our listeners that uh, as we move forward, it's not like the old versions die or don't work anymore or can't be used any longer. Do, do, they do still exist. Do you offer them for download, though? Yeah. You can yeah, go there? Yeah, you're able to actually... Nice. Yeah, you're able to actually, in the download link, just change it to uh, Spinrite 5, and you get that's that great. version of Spinrite. Yeah, from that's download. really good. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and finally, Oak Song, tweeting as Oak Song, he said at SGGRC, glad to know I can still use those on-track managed drives. And, you know, <laughs> good. <yeah. laughs> we Wonderful. know he's joking or hope he's joking. <laughs> but here again, uh, Spinrite 6.1 won't have any support for that. It'll just look at you. I mean, it'll see the drive and, and run, but it won't see the, the wacky partitions that it contains, whereas Spinrite 6 will. So everybody will be That's able cool. to use Spinrite 6 if you do run across an on-track managed drive. <laughs> Who knows, you know? I bet there's some out there. Maybe, uh, maybe even yeah. storing some Bitcoin our wallets. Given listeners, Leo, know, I, gar I guarantee it. You saw the guy who's offering $20 million to some uh, town, I think it's in New Jersey, if they will find his discarded hard drive with oh. hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin on it. Oh. <laughs> And the other one, the guy who put it on one of those uh, locked hard drives, he only has right, two he's more. Got two guesses left. <laughs> he says, "I've come to grips with it." Oh, <laughs> oh, his is worth two hundred forty million. Yikes! Ouch. That's a, that's life changing amount of money. I think that. <sighs> yeah, I got a life changing uh, internet uh, security device for you. We talk about APTs, advanced persistent threats, on this show all the time. That's when a bad guy gets into your network, uh, sets off no alarms, because, you know, like solar winds, these guys, they're sneaky, uh, and just wanders around for months. Um, that's not good. I think you understand that. If only there were some way to lure those people out of hiding. Well, there is the Thinkst. Canary. Oh, man, what a great idea this is. It's a honeypot that's easy to install, easy to configure. It's basically an internet appliance uh, or a network appliance that you put on your network. Uh, they don't look vulnerable by no means. They just look valuable. You can add them to your, you know, your active directory. Uh, you can make it appear to be almost any kind of device. The one I have sitting right here is a Synology NAS. Uh, with the Synology login page, it even has the proper MAC address. Everything indistinguishable from a Synology NAS, except if somebody tries to log into it, uh, I will immediately get an, an alert, a notice. Um, in fact, if somebody even scans it, I'll get a notice. That's how we knew that there was a rogue device on our internal network. Last year or the year before, we were testing... Um, uh, another, I won't say what it was, but another from a well-known company system. It turned out it was scanning all the IP addresses in the network. I got an alert from my canary. We were. It, it said it's inside the network. It was a 10 dot address. We went, oh my God, what is this? Found it, took it out. We knew, held it by the tail as we threw it out. Canary has changed the breach game for so many companies. Last thing you want or need right now is a data breach. It's embarrassing. It costs you money. It could cost you your reputation. But you have a hero here to save you. The Thinkst Canary is waiting for the bad guys, waiting for those APTs. It's always the case, or often the case, companies find out about these attacks way too late. Uh, I think on average six months after the attack happened. And that's after they've spent millions on IT security. You can install your Canary or Canaries anywhere on your network. They can look like anything from a Windows server to a SCADA device, a Linux box. You can turn on a Christmas tree of services or pick a select few juicy services to leave on. You decide what the canary looks like. 
And as attackers are browsing, they'll look in the Active Directory for file servers. They'll explore file shares, looking for documents. They'll try default passwords against, you know, known, known uh, built-in hardwired passwords against network devices and web services. But it's not what they think it is. It's a canary, which means you'll get a notification. And I love the way they do this. They, they don't bombard you with notifications, just notifications at that critical moment when you can really use them. Another thing you can do with a canary that's really cool, and we talked about this ages ago uh, on the show, you can generate canary tokens. These are little trip wires you can put around your network, hundreds of them, unlimited number. The way it works is they look like a document a Word document or a PDF. You know, we have PD, we have Excel spreadsheets uh, here and there on our network saying things like payroll information or employee records. You know, something that would entice a hacker. They double-click it thinking they're going to open up an Excel document or they even, you know, download it. And we immediately get a notification, an alert. We know there's somebody in there. And that's what you need. The Thinks Canary philosophy is trivial to deploy ridiculously high quality of signal. You can get alerts by email or text message. You get a console with your canaries. You, you, they work with Slack or webhooks or syslog or their API. Whatever way you want to be notified, they can do it. It takes on average 191 days. There it is, six months for a company to realize there's been a data breach. That's too long. By that time, they could have exfiltrated everything. The people who make canaries have been in this business for more than 20 years. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments how to break into networks, and they've used that knowledge to create the ultimate protection tool, the Thinks Canary. All over the world, they're in every continent, all seven continents. They're one of the best tools against data breaches. If you go to, there's two websites. Go to, if you want to see who's using canaries, because some people don't mind saying it, canary.tools love. A bunch of uh, tweets from people who l love their canaries, and there's what's not to love. Uh, but if you want to get a deal on a canary or find out more, use our address, canary.tools slash twit. I'll give you an example. You can get as many or as a few as you need. Some big companies might have hundreds. little company might have just a handful. But let's say you want five, okay? 7500 bucks a year. You get your own hosted console. You get upgrades. You get support. You get maintenance. If somebody sits on your canary and breaks it <laughs> or throws it out, they'll send you a new one just like that. No questions asked. If you use the code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box, please do that because then they know you heard about it here. But you also get 10% off the canary for life, forever. Now, we know you're going to love your things, canary, but if for any reason... You're not happy. You can return your canaries. There's a two-month, 60-day money-back guarantee, and you'll get a full refund. I This just seems to me a security no-brainer. Canary.tools slash twit. And don't forget the offer code twit and how did you hear about us, Box. Thank you, Thinkst, for uh, helping protect us, for supporting the show. Thank you for supporting the show by using that address. Canary.tools slash twit. The offer code T-W-I-T. Now back to Steve, and it's time to talk about where the plain text is. Uh, so, WhatsApp has shown us oh, yeah. that it's not only Zoom's CEO, Eric Wan, yeah. who is deftly able to somehow locate the exact center of a large pile of poo <laughs> to step in. Nicely put. <laughs> In Eric's case, well-meaning though he was, every time he opened his mouth in a well-meaning attempt to clarify something, he made things worse, often much worse. And now, over the past week, in an apparent gross misunderstanding of why their own users were using their secure messaging product in the first place, WhatsApp, as we know, has managed to trigger such an exodus from their platform that the two primary alternatives, Telegram and Signal, have never seen such increases in their user base. And in fact, Signal has continued having trouble staying online amid the deluge. Um, we reported last week that Signal was struggling to authenticate the torrent of incoming users since they require an SMS messaging loop and the cellular carriers were apparently having 
scaling issues of their own. Then that trouble apparently migrated from the authentication side to the service itself. Um, for example, this triggered signal outages and a tweet last Friday from Edward Snowden. Uh, Edward tweeted, for those wondering about signal apps scaling, WhatsApp's decision to sell out its users to Facebook has led to what is probably the biggest digital migration to a more secure messenger we've ever seen. Hang in there while the signal team catches up. And then signed Edward Snowden, January 15, 2021. <laughs> and the rush may have been further accelerated when Elon Musk simply tweeted the two words, use signal <laughs> so to his 42.6 <laughs> million it's amazing. followers. Just amazing. <laughs> so one of the questions that inevitably arises from any use of a free service is, why is it free? And who's paying for this? This, of course, reminds us of the famous joke. Well, yeah, we do lose money on each one, but don't worry, we make it up in volume. So this is one of the reasons why if I were to use any third-party messaging app, and I don't, because I just don't have any need for any, I would still choose Threema, which is paid for one time, although that there are some enterprise subscription deals, and that one time generates operating revenue for the company. Um, oh, yeah, and as I mentioned, their, their, their so-called Threema work product for the enterprise has a subscription model. So again, we understand how they are monetizing. Um, and just as a reminder, to, since I mentioned Telegram and, and Signal, I just checked in with Wikipedia to see what they said about Threema. Um, they said Threema was founded in December 2012 by Manuel Casper. Uh, the company was initially called Casper Systems, GmbH, German. Martin Blatter and Sylvan Engler were later recruited to develop an Android application that was released in 2013. In summer 2013, the Snowden links helped create an interest in Threema, boosting the user numbers to the hundreds of thousands. When Facebook took over WhatsApp in February 2014, Threema got 200,000 new users, doubling its user base in 24 hours. Around 80% 80% of those new users came from Germany, which I guess makes sense since it's a, you know, a German company. By March 2014, Threema had 1.2 million users. In spring 2014, operations have been transferred to the newly created Threema GmbH. In December 2014, Apple listed Threema as the most sold app of 2014 in the German App Store. In 2020, last year, Threema expanded with video calls. We talked about that at the time. Um, plans to make its code base fully open source, as well as introduce reproducible builds and Threema Education, a variation of Threema intended for education institutions. And finally, Wikipedia is up to date. During the second week of 2021, which is to say last week, Threema saw a quadrupling of daily downloads spurred on by controversial privacy changes in the WhatsApp messaging service. A spokesperson for the company also confirmed that Threema had risen to the top of the charts for paid applications in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. This trend continued into the third week of the year, with the head of marketing and sales confirming that downloads had increased to 10 times the regular amount, leading to hundreds of thousands of new users each day. So, yeah, <clears throat> if I had any need for private messaging, Threema would be my choice. I would carefully and manually exchange my Threema public key with the people I need to converse with secretly, and that would be that. Um, when I was working with Rasmus on the Squirrel Zenforo integration, at his suggestion, we used Signal. 
not because we needed any super secrecy, but because it had a convenient Windows desktop client and we were in different time zones. So we were able to easily exchange messages, screenshots, and links that way. And when we happened to both be awake at the same time, our interaction would go interactive. Um, and it was comforting to know that our exchanges could not be intercepted and decrypted. You know, th th but that's, you know, these days that's sort of expected, right? Um, but I'm interested in the massive effect that was driven by WhatsApp's statement that they intend to share messaging metadata with Facebook's other businesses. Um, it's as if everyone using WhatsApp believed that Facebook purchased WhatsApp out of the goodness of their heart in order to offer the entire world a free messaging service without any strings. As we noted above, about the influx to Threema when Facebook announced their purchase of WhatsApp in the first place, even back then, not everyone believed in the free lunch theory. So when Facebook dropped their other shoe about their plans for further monetizing their WhatsApp users, no one should have been surprised. It's always been clear that sooner or later, Facebook would do this. And if they cannot peer into the conversations, then they'll at least collect everything they're able to from the outside. Uh, it seems to me that knowing who I'm talking to and when and for how long and where we're located is an intrusion. But hey, it's free. Uh, the problem was that they made, I think, too large a change all at once. It's like the old joke about how to boil a frog. You don't toss a frog into boiling water because it will jump right out. Instead, you place the frog into cold and comfortable water, then slowly turn up the heat. In retrospect, Facebook should have patiently and very slowly chipped away, little by little, at the privacy of their WhatsApp users through a series of much smaller privacy incursions. There is a very non-zero switching cost associated with changing messaging platforms. Right now, Twitter is full of people complaining that they just switched to Signal, but no one they know is there. So, so it's not enough just to make the move. You need to move your entire community. And that's often difficult in the extreme. So if Facebook had instead chipped away at their users' privacy, at each step, the user would reconsider the switching cost of leaving WhatsApp, where all of their friends already are, and they might recall their disappointment the last time they tried, versus the loss of just one additional little privacy aspect that really doesn't matter that much anyway, right? Um, and if that had been the strategy, it seems clear that many fewer would have left. Now, of course, they've said, oh, uh, wait a minute, uh, we're going to postpone for 90 days. And, you know, you everybody misunderstood what it was we were doing. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to, you know, try to be much better about communicating this. Right. And, of course, as we know, instead of understanding that this incremental approach should have been taken, WhatsApp and Facebook yeah, it sort of seems like maybe they got a little too big for their britches and lowered the boom on their users all at once. You know, with as we talked about last week, the agree to this or else you will be disconnected, you know, uh, approach. So anyway, no ma no wonder the result has been a mass exodus. The truth is, I think, essentially no users understand the underlying technology and privacy guarantees of the messaging systems they're using. And in fact, the illusion is enough. Everybody wants the illusion of complete privacy, even if they don't actually have much. Just tell them that they do. Tell them it's good. Tell them it uses military-grade encryption. 
tell them how many billions of years it would take for the world's largest supercomputer to crack their grocery list. But whatever you do, don't mention that a simple keystroke logger would render every bit of that fancy technology completely superfluous. They don't want to hear that. Out of curiosity, I googled the phrase secure messaging apps, wondering what would come up. And I received a list of links. 10 most secure messaging apps, hyphen best encrypted chat app. 10 messaging apps comparison. The best encrypted messaging apps you should use today. Best encrypted messaging apps Tom's Guide. The most secure messaging apps for Android and iOS 2020. That was hosted by AVG. And one of our sponsors, actually, of this show, came up with the the last link that I was quoting here. The best private and secure messaging apps in 2021 brought to you by ExpressVPN. So... Does any of this matter? No. As we know, there are subtle differences between apps and their underlying technologies. Through the years, we've covered them all right here on the podcast. Mostly, the differences boil down to the way the various apps exchange and manage their users' keys. Since the keys are everything. But here's the bottom line. Any Proper use of encryption turns the conversation on the wire into maximum entropy noise with no discernible patterns and no feasible means of decrypting what's intercepted over the wire ever. Yes, your grocery list is safe. But, and this is the point, that is the only protection that any of these apps can provide. That's it, period. The only thing that any of these apps can guarantee is that while the data is in motion between endpoints, it is utterly infeasible for it to ever be decrypted. That's the only guarantee, and they all have it. But any keystroke logger defeats any of these apps, no matter how many layers of military-grade encryption have been employed after the keystrokes have been logged. And of course, I'm using the term keystroke logger because it's such a clear and well-understood term. It, you know, it stands in for the concept that I want to convey, which is that on-the-wire encryption no longer means anything about our actual true privacy. If you look at the packets moving across today's internet, unlike the internet of 15 years ago when we began this podcast, all you will ever see today is packets full of noise, just 100% random bits of noise. Today, it's all noise. It's all encrypted. And no one bothers looking at it because Anyone who wants to know what's in those packets also knows quite well that the encryption problem has long since been solved and that none of that noise on the wire can be decrypted. The apocryphal story of the infamous bank robber, Willie Sutton, applies here. You know, the story goes that a reporter once asked Willie why it was that he robbed banks. And Willie was said to reply, because that's where the money is. Updating the story to 2021, a non-technical supervisor at the NSA might ask one of their top technical managers why all of the agency's work has been diverted to investments in keystroke logging, to which the technical manager would reply, because that's where the plain text is. The point I hope to make is that, barring some implementation mistake, none of this what's the best messaging app conversation matters in terms of its security. 
the real world has moved on. We've long observed that the best camera is the one you have with you. Similarly, the best messaging app is the one shared by the people with whom you wish to communicate, period. All other things being equal, I would choose the one with a clear and simple economic model that I understand and that makes sense to me. If I don't care about my metadata being monetized, you know, about Facebook tracking everyone with whom I communicate, then WhatsApp, whose economic model clearly requires it to eventually be snooping on me, would be just fine. But if I do wonder who's paying for this service, and if I would prefer to it be to be very clearly me in exchange for not having the fact of my communications being monetized, then Threema would be my choice. But in any event, the privacy pro provided by encryption should no longer factor into the equation because it doesn't matter at all. Anyone who wishes to have access to the content of our conversations will go after the plain text before it's encrypted or after it's decrypted. And I do remain uncomfortable with the autonomous key management offered by many of these systems, including iMessage. But, you know, that's also splitting hairs and really doesn't matter either. If I really cared to have a private conversation, I would never use a smartphone at all. Yeah, I think that's fair. You said it before. Yeah. Take off your clothes, go in the middle of a field. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then get... Taken away and locked <laughs> as up a in a loony bin. But a <laughs> secure nuts. nut, and that's what's important. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. You, you know, meet with somebody you trust, leave all your electronic devices in your cars, yeah. go into the middle of a field with a yeah. big, thick comforter, you know, throw the comforter Hide your mouth, over you. Because there's lip readers. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Throw the comforter over you and then whisper to each other. <laughs> and any use of technology today. Yeah. And you, it is you, your privacy is just a hope. You know, it's it's just a well. No one's probably probably listening. And you're probably right. You know, any of this is secure. You know, like like when 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 Rasmus and I were were using Signal back and forth. Oh, well, it's cool that it's got industrial grade. You know, triple scoop encryption. But you know, I'm just wanting to say, okay, which link was that? Yeah. You know, and <laughs> yeah. no, it's just not secret. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of privacy theater, I guess, in the world. Yeah, it yeah. Does, really feels like a much to do about nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, and and if, if if you are a WhatsApp user and also a Facebook user, well, you're 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 already having you're being yeah. tracked up the you know what. Yeah. So, you know, who cares if your messaging app joins, you know, joins the community? <laughs> it's January, and it's time for the Twit Audience Survey. The annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make your listening experience even better. Completely anonymous, and it only takes a few minutes. So go to twit.tv slash survey21 to take it. And thanks in advance. That's Steve Gibson, and uh, he's a ray of truth in a cloudy world. Uh, if you like the show, you can listen to it when we do it every Tuesday. You can actually listen live. We, uh, we kind of keep a live stream going for all of our shows. So you can watch it behind the scenes. We do the show Tuesday, 1.30, we shoot for anyway, 1.30 Pacific. Uh, that's 4.30 Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. The live audio and video streams are at twit.tv slash live. If you're watching live, the chat room's live also, and it's a good place to go hang out with other people watching the show. IRC.twit.tv. Uh, we have on-demand versions of the show. Actually, Steve's got the most interesting variants. He has a low bandwidth 16 kilobit version, which doesn't sound great, but at least it's small. He also, speaking of small files, probably the smallest file is the text file of the transcripts written uh, uh, by Steve's commission um, uh, by Elaine Ferris, who does a wonderful job. So you can read along as you listen or just read. It's very useful for searching, too, because you can search the transcripts and find the point of the show that you want to listen to. Uh, that's all at grc.com, Steve's website. He also has 64 kilobit audio uh, there, grc.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of Spinrite. 
If you get 6.0 now, you'll get 6.1 the minute it comes out for free. You'll also get to participate in the development and the beta testing process. Spinrite, of course, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. Lots of free stuff at Steve's site, too. Uh, so it's a fun place to, uh, a fun rabbit hole to fall down into and browse around. We have audio and video at our website, twit.tv slash sn. Twit.tv slash, all the shows are at twit.tv, but this show is twit.tv slash sn for security now. Um, you can also, if you listen, you know, uh, on your schedule asynchronously, uh, chat with us at our Twit forums. That's www.twit.community. We have a Mastodon instance. If you want to join the Fediverse, that's twit.social. You're welcome to join there. We love having you. Um, and of course, you can always get a copy of uh, the show from uh, YouTube, there's a YouTube channel, or subscribe in your favorite podcast client. You'll get it automatically the minute it's available. Uh, I will see you next Tuesday, I guess, Steve. Have a great week. Yay. Okay, buddy. Bye. We do appreciate you watching this show right here on the Twit Network. If you want to make sure you are up to date on all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, all the OSs from Apple, you've got to check out iOS today. Rosemary Orchard, the incredible Rosemary Orchard, and myself talk each week about the news for iOS, the best apps and games, and so much more. You've got to check out the show. And we do appreciate you for subscribing. Security.